so enough of that. Welcome to the Hard Sell, the programme all about adverts. I'm a pretty typical old-fashioned pre-metrosexual bloke in some ways, specifically in that I know nothing of clothes or fashion and tend to actively avoid anything that might change this. That's why the company profiled in today's Not Brand X was something of a godsend, until it was forced into exile at the turn of the century. I'm the man in grey, just the man at CNN. Once upon a time there was a mid-range high street clothing store, although I understand the preferred term these days is fast fashion. Either way, CNA was once an immutable part of the British retail landscape. The store and its products would never be accused of being chic or hip. The fashions of the early 80s in particular seem to have confused the hell out of them. And only occasionally would they garner a grudging description as stylish. But he still could have done a whole lot worse, style-wise, and more importantly, they were inexpensive. That was the CNA difference. They were a compromise between fashion and poverty. With CNA, you could achieve a reasonable level of stylishness, more or less, for relatively little outlay. Of course, the advertising tended to exaggerate the former, while specifically highlighting the latter. The original C and A were Clemens and August Brenningmeyer, Dutch textilers who originally formed the company as a linen concern in the middle of the 19th century. Their descendants still own and operate the company to this day, as a secretive and often downright unsettling family clique, speaking in code and training to run the company from childhood, with slogans like, Openness is weakness, and that's saying nothing of their method of surviving Nazi occupation, and making sure they were in on the ground floor by cozying up to them as early as 1937. Scary bastards, but successful. It's still going strong in Europe, particularly in Germany. CNA, that is, not Nazism. Add your own punchline. As well as in Brazil, Mexico and China. The Brazilian branch even had a line endorsed and ostensibly designed by the god empress Beyoncé herself. So they're in a healthy state, they just don't exist in Britain anymore. And that's not because they rejected us. We rejected them. With the best will in the world, most clothing advertising is much for muchers. Here's some cool people wearing cool clothes to cool music. We demand that you desire this. Of course, cool can mean a lot of different things. And where CNA are concerned, it's often an informed attribute at best. Here's what cool meant, or more accurately, what CNA desperately wanted you to believe that cool meant, at the peak of the store's powers in the mid-70s. <laughs> See what we can do with a man at CNA. Come and see and see the things you're looking for. Come and see and see surprises everywhere. Open up your eyes. Mirrors don't tell lies. It's a beautiful day. Come and see and Come and see and It's such a surprising store. Crimpling jackets nipped at the waist. Sweaters. PVC trench coats. Sweaters. Tracksuits with more zips than scents. Knee-length overcoats and blue slacks. Knitted argyle cardigans with heavy wool collars. So many sweaters. Yes, the man at CNA was never at the forefront of style. There's a reason, the phrase was essentially a punchline for such a long time. But the company could hardly acknowledge that in the advertising, which put them in a horrible bind, a kind of absurdist inverted humble brag. The curse of the uncool competing with the cool. They could hardly increase sales by saying our clothes are adequate, refreshing though the honesty might have been. Fortunately, they did have another angle, arguably the most important. They were cheap and convenient. Nice, if uninspiring, clothing and accessories right on your doorstep. Well, the high street. 
and for a mere bag of shells. Why, you might could pop in for one thing and come out with 900 completely different things. Now that sounds like a segue. Just popped in for a new tie. Come and see Annie. We've got a world of clothes for you. A world of fashion that's international. Feels like it'd travel well. Paris. Plymouth. Actually. Better have a shirt as well. C and A have the flair. You'll see it in everything you choose. And with the flair, there's a quality care we look at closely because we know you will too. I can't. Look at the flair. Look at the care. Got the tie, sir. Ah. Fashion costs less, as always. The main rivals at this point were Marks and Spencer, and to a lesser extent the likes of British home stores and Littlewoods. All three had wider remits than CNA, selling furnishings, haberdashery, even groceries and entertainments right alongside the clothes. CNA were always a straight ahead clothes and accessories store, to the point where some people genuinely thought that was what the letters stood for. That or coats and hats. This narrower focus might look like a weakness, and indeed could have been spun as such by rival firms if that sort of attack advertising wasn't illegal in this country. But in the absence of such an option, it was left to CNA to spin it into a strength, if only in as much as their advertising didn't have to cover so much ground in 30 to 60 seconds. CNA beat BHS and Littlewoods on convenience alone, or if truth be told, they also actually had a slight edge product-wise in the BHS and Littlewoods' clothing erred in the direction of functional even more than CNA's. M and S were a more formidable enemy. They were actually classy and fashionable, everything both CNA and its shoppers aspired to be. Unfortunately for them, they were also concomitantly expensive, and that was CNA's salvation. Their basic customer base was people who couldn't afford M and S but still desired at the very least some kind of plausible deniability as far as stylishness was concerned. That was CNA's niche, and they fit snugly into it. Probably too snugly. As with so much else, things started to change in the 80s. Man at CNA wasn't becoming any less of a punchline. Your shoes will be made by Gucci. Your jewellery will come from Asprey's. Your clothes will be made by... Man at CNA. <laughs> and post punk, new wave, new romanticism, and God knows what else started taking youth fashions into interesting new areas that CNA didn't quite understand as well as they had back in the days of the flared trouser. Worse, a bunch of new competitors came along in the 80s, like Next, or most notably Topshop. Suddenly, CNA weren't the only choice for half-decent clothes at very decent prices. They didn't worry over much at first. Both Next and Topshop struggled in their first decade to the extent that Next very nearly didn't survive it. And even they were that bit pricier than CNA, without, then, the name recognition. CNA might not have had the fashion edge, but they still had the value-for-money angle sewn up, and that was still the bottom line of their advertising. The promise of low prices could sell the store itself, but with all these new rivals popping out of nowhere, there was a need to establish the product in a new way, distinct from the inherent cheapness that the name CNA was conjuring up. So they started to make more and better use of their exclusive labels.
had several. Man at CNA was only one. There was also the inexplicably named Clockhouse for young women, Jessica for casual chic, the punning Canda for power dressing, and Sixth Sense for the more mature lady. And new for the 80s, Avanti, vaguely alien fashions for the new wave youth who CNA didn't understand but, but desperately wanted to shop there. The rather desperate hope was that CNA's image would change into something closer to actively fashionable rather than just acceptably functional, and quickly, because more of these rival stores were opening all the time. Principles, New Look, E-Town. It got worse as the 90s progressed. A whole new subset emerged. Matalan, Peacocks, TK Maxx, Primark, budget clothing stores, right on CNA's traditional high street turf, offering clothes almost as good for even less outlay siphoning off their customer base by the gallon. Worst of all, the bloody supermarkets got serious as well, starting to sell clothing as a rule in their regular downtown stores, and even hiring well-known designers like George Davies to launch their own supermarket labels. The game had fundamentally changed. CNA realised too late that their comfortable place somewhere in the middle of the tree was based solely on the assumption that no one could possibly avenge something like a ladder and use that to reach the same position, proceeding then to crowd them out. They'd been trumped on price, and more importantly on price relative to quality. They had one thing to fall back on. Longevity, and with it reputation. And that meant they were in trouble, because their name was a punchline at worst, and even at best, hardly associated in the public consciousness with cutting-edge fashion. Still, even if on reputation alone they were never going to defeat Miss Selfridge and New Look, let alone a newly resurgent Next and Topshop, it was still sharp enough of a weapon to serve against Matalan and George. More importantly, it was all they had, so as profits dwindled towards a singularity, CNA made their last anguished roll of the dice with the CNA Today campaign a desperate attempt to finally hurl themselves into fashionability, or more pressingly, desirability. a completely ridiculous notion, their traditional rival Marks and Spencers were also struggling at this point, partly due to their traditional high prices. Their clothes were seen as more stylish than CNAs, but not that much more. There was a potential space in the market, M&S quality, or close to, at affordable prices. CNA might just have managed to wriggle into that little gap. And they tried so hard. They used every technique in the playbook. They invoked Terence Donovan, David Bailey, Brian Duffy, Rankin, Peter Lindbergh, Pecker. They did everything they could think of to make their clothes seem cool and classy. Sophisticated editing, logo as fetish object, clear glass motifs. They reached for the M&S market until they sprained their shoulders. But always, the Matalan and TK Maxx demographic held them by their ankles 
hissing that they belong down there with the rest of the slave labour made discount prol coverings. Try as they might, CNA couldn't shake off their public image as a cheap and perfunctory high street retailer of dubious stylishness and little or no fashion credibility. Maybe, maybe better than TK Maxx, but still not as good as Top Shop. They were neither one thing nor the other. The style conscious went to Next and Top Shop. The impoverished or just stingy went to Matalan and Peacocks. No one went to CNA. Or m and for that matter. Top Shop and Next ultimately filled that gap too. The uncool factor of the CNA name was just too heavy a weight. Nothing if not practically minded, not to mention as ruthless as a parliament of jackals. The Brudding Myers decided to cut their losses and detonate the entire company, in Britain at least, closing all 109 stores in the country at once and unhappening almost 5,000 jobs. This was announced in mid-2000 and completed within a year. You don't know what you've got till it's gone. CNA are mourned in this country to this day. Well, they're remembered with an amount of fondness by some people. Just go with it. CNA are mourned in this country to this day. Their clothes were classier than you'd get at the increasingly ubiquitous discount stores and less given to fall apart at the slightest hint of strain or washing. And slave labour for you. They were almost as stylish as Topshop if you squinted a bit but cheaper and not owned by this prick. They weren't cool, however hard they tried, but we turned out to miss them when they left. At least they're not actually dead. No, just divorced. Like an underappreciated spouse finally losing patience with being taken for granted, they packed up and left us behind, suddenly bereft watching them enjoy great success from a distance with a variety of new exotic lovers, only able to visit on the odd occasion wherein we discover they don't even recognise us or speak our language anymore. Baby, we miss you. This is Bobby Goldsborough and Honey. You've been watching a Bob the Fish production. Thanks! If you haven't found it already, be sure to check out our website at bobthefish.org.uk. Literally hundreds of videos, not unlike this one, that will make you laugh, think, and realize new things, or your money back. Which works out great because they're all absolutely free. All of this is possible thanks to the not unique way that Bob the Fish productions are paid for by you, the viewing public, via Patreon. For a donation of as little as one pound a month, not only do you ensure that I still have food and shelter so I can carry on making these programs, but you could become eligible for a whole host of cool extras. New video essays, special event live streams, all my content a week in advance, and my book on the history of the BBC, Roll the Waves, chapter by chapter as it's written. And some cake, if you go out and buy a cake and eat it while you're watching. And if you don't want to support on a monthly basis, you can make a one-off donation via coffee. It all helps stave off scurvy. BobTheFish.org.uk You make it what it is.